Hey guys, welcome back to another online lecture for organic chemistry. Professor Tomney here from ChemComplete, and we are going to wrap up our SN2 analysis this time. So please make sure you watch the other two videos that come before this one. This is part three. Uh, just to briefly recap, we talked about substitution nucleophilic reactions, uh, SN2. They are bimolecular, meaning the leaving group and the nucleophile have to interact at the same time with the alkyl substituent. We then talked about reacting considerations. We've gone through three of them. The position of the leaving group, methyl, primary, secondary, tertiary, and vanillic. This is governed by sterics. The identity of your leaving group is important. We said that weak bases make for very good leaving groups. Tosylate is the king of leaving groups because it is resonance stabilized. We then have iodine, bromine, and chlorine with the hydroxide, fluoride, and the amide groups ranking in the bottom tier they are not really even considered legitimate leaving groups unless you can protonate them and get them to leave so in, for instance if i have an alcohol i can protonate it to create water water will leave into solution because water is a weak base not a strong base we then talk about the choice of nucleophile couple important points that when we're dealing with the same atom for instance oxygen we are going to parallel basicity when we are talking about nucleophilicity we are going to increase our nucleophilicity going down a column. So therefore, uh, sulfur would be a better nucleophile than its corresponding oxygen counterpart. Uh, you know, all other things being considered equal and the same. The negative charge nucleophiles are stronger than the neutral charge nucleophiles in terms of their ability to be a good nucleophile. Strong nucleophiles and charged nucleophiles are preferred for SN2 reactions. So now we get to the choice of solvent. And this is probably one of the ones that nucleophiles, but this is one of the ones students struggle with the most. So uh, it's pretty easy to type out, but then we have to talk about the theory. So the choice of solvent for an SN2 reaction. SN2 requires a polar A protic with an A in front of that protic solvent. Okay. Now, there's two important parts here, polar and aprotic. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that solvents have not really been considered a major player in reactions up to this point in organic chemistry lectures, or at least most of them. Um, but now solvent effects come into a very large scope, and we have to start considering the solvents that we pick out here. So for a polar aprotic solvent, the reason we want something polar is because if you consider our general SN2 reaction, so here's R, I'm going to go ahead and pick out bromine as my leaving group, and then I will pick out minus, let's do minus SH as my nucleophile, right? So, and uh, just a side note, if you ever see something like this, NASH, that's the same as SH minus, right? Because this becomes Na plus and minus SH when you place it into a solvent should completely dissociate into the ionic components. Anyway, moving on, this should come in as the leaving group leaves. That's the definition of an SN2 reaction, right? And then I should end up with that. I would get a thiol. Now, when this reaction occurs, I want my solvent that I select, right? And we'll just put solvent under here for right now. I want the solvent that I place all this stuff in to be polar. And that's important because take a look at what I have here. I have minus SH. That is incredibly polar because it's got a negative charge associated with it, right? And then if you take a look, I also have RX, uh, where X, in this case we had bromide, but X is certainly partially negative and R is partially positive. So all of the reagents used in an SN2 are polar reagents. And you want to keep in mind that like dissolves like, right? So that's basically our general rule that we use when we are going through organic chemistry. And, well, when you talk about general chemistry as well, you talk about like dissolves like. Um, and so when we have like dissolves like, you want to consider that you need a polar solvent in order to get these guys solubilized and moving around when you're doing this. All right, so the next thing we want to talk about is this term aprotic, okay? 
Now, the term protic refers to a hydrogen on an oxygen group or on a nitrogen group. So these selections right here would be considered protic. Okay. So if I want something that is aprotic, it means essentially non-protic, I want to pick out a solvent that does not have an OH or an NH, and we're going to explain why in a second, okay? So we understand polar, but aprotic is what's favored for SN2, and this means that the solvent should have no OH bonds. It can have an H and an O, they just can't be bonded to one another, or NH bonds. And the reason for this really has to do with hydrogen bonding, because oxygen and nitrogen, when they have hydrogens attached, are very good at performing hydrogen bonding, right? So if I consider something like water, water can hydrogen bond to other water molecules. So let's take a look at why this might be problematic if we do pick out a protic solvent. So right now we're going to suspend the rules and we're going to say, all right, I'm going to pick out a protic solvent. So let's say that my nucleophile is minus SH, right? And then I decide that I am going to use H2O as my solvent. And so when I put H2O into solution, or I should say when I put my, my minus SH into solution, because the the solvent is really the water. The water is going to start aligning itself with the thiol group here. And it's going to attempt a hydrogen bond to the thiol group because it sees that there's this minus charge here. And so from a polar perspective, right, if I take a look at water, water has the following sort of dipole electronic structure. I've got an oxygen. The oxygen has a partial negative and I have partial positives on these hydrogens. They are going to attempt to align themselves and create hydrogen bonds to this negatively charged nucleophile, right? So I can draw another one over here. And in fact, I may get rid of that first one because that's not really in a great position. But here, this is partial positive. It's going to align itself and try to hydrogen bond itself, right? And so let's ignore that one for right now, the way I drew that one out partially negative. So here comes another one, right? I've got another water, partially positive, partially negative. So you get the idea, right? All of these hydrogen bonds that are aligning themselves with the, uh, the thiol group here in the middle, okay, this is a stabilizing effect. So the water, keep in mind, these are molecules, they are just aligning themselves due to their electrostatic potentials in the best way possible. And so these hydrogen bonds, this is a very natural thing to do. It wants to come and create these interactions to help support the thiol group, right? Because this minus SH is pretty high in energy, and that's what makes it, part of what makes it a good nucleophile, is that it has high energy, so it has that aggressiveness, that ability to get in there as the leaving group is leaving. This process, this hydrogen bonding process, right? So if I undergo H bonding, this is stabilizing, right? So something that was negatively charged was amped up, ready to go to get into that uh, partially positive. So again, keep in mind we have Rx, right? Partially positive. We had a nucleophile minus SH that had a negative charge. It was ready to go. It was ready to attack this partial positive as the leaving group leaves. But what I'm doing here, when I have a polar protic solvent present, is I'm stabilizing the energy of this nucleophile. Now that may sound like a good thing at first when we talk about stability in organic chemistry, but what you're really doing is you're going to lower the energy of the nucleophile, right? And if I lower the energy of the nucleophile, what does that mean for my reaction up here? It means that the nucleophile is not going to have the same sort of energy that it needs in order to get in and accomplish this bimolecular reaction at the same time the leaving group is leaving. So you can almost imagine that this is a energetic player in a game, right? And then you have these large other, I don't know, you could say football players, whatever you want to say. You have these other large individuals that are coming by and they think they're helping to stabilize this person, but really what they're doing is they're getting in the way, right? 
And so if you have huge, huge, enormous amounts of solvent in comparison to your solute, the thiol that you put in, you're going to overwhelm your nucleophile with hydrogen bonding, and that is going to be problematic. It's going to lower the energy of the nucleophile, and it's basically going to make it so that the nucleophile is not very reactive. Uh, it's going to be pretty unreactive towards this entire situation here, this entire SN2 reaction, okay? And so because of that, hopefully you understand, when we do SN2, we are looking for polar because we do want to dissolve our compounds. We have to get them into solution, but we need aprotic solvents, okay? So to give you an example, one common aprotic solvent is acetone. I have a dipole moment, right? Here's CH3 and CH3. I have a dipole moment in the direction of this oxygen. Notice I have hydrogens and I have oxygens, but I don't have OH bonds. I don't have alcohols. And so this uh, acetone, this is a ketone, acetone, is considered a polar aprotic solvent. Good choice for SN2. There are lots and lots of others, okay? Uh, for instance, acetonitrile, ch 3 c double bond N, again, contains the nitrogen, contains that polarity, has a dipole moment, but it does not have an NH, okay? So polar protic solvents, things like methanol or other alcohols, water, um, amine groups, those are ones you're going to have to look out for. And so to give you a general list, you've got acetone. Okay, I'm not going to draw these out, but you are welcome to go look at them in a book. You have DMF dimethylformide. You have um, DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide. I will draw out DMSO because that's a very common one. So dimethyl means two methyl groups, and I've got a sulfoxide, right? So that is DMSO. DMSO is a fantastic polar aprotic solvent. Very, very polar. Um, however, when you take a look at the, uh, the bonding, it's aprotic because I don't have any alcohol or amine groups there. A um, couple other ones. HMPA, it's probably one of the best ones you could get. Uh, we mentioned the acetonitrile up here, um, and that's that handful is pretty good. I mean, that covers most of it. So acetone, DMF, DMSO, HMPA, uh, which is like hexamethyl something amine. I can't remember right off the top of my head. Um, but acetone, DMF, DMSO, HMPA, and your acetonitrile, which you have up here, all very good selections for your SN2 reaction. So keep your solvents polar, but keep them aprotic when you're doing SN2. Again, the reason for that, um, from sort of an energy perspective, right? If I were to draw an energy diagram, if I were to do this with a polar aprotic solvent, I might have something like this. Whereas if I turn around and I do something with a polar protic solvent, I'm lowering the energy of the reactants, right? So let's pick out a different color here so we can distinguish it. I'll do red. So, because red's sort of like a, an alert, right? So if I end up doing a polar protic solvent, I'm following the same pathway, so to speak. However, I'm really lowering the energy here of my nucleophile, right? because I'm stabilizing it. Um, so when you're talking about this, this is a little bit deceptive because you're talking about the free energy of your reactants. Um, but what you're doing is you're basically, you are increasing the energy to the transition state. So I'm going to need more energy to get up to the transition state if I'm picking out a polar protic solvent. In a polar aprotic solvent, I have much nicer energetic uh, setups going on, and that's beneficial for the reaction. Okay. So the last thing I want to mention down here when we talk about product consideration, we've mentioned a couple times that SN2 will always undergo a, uh, we underlining here, I guess that's okay. So the stereochemical effect, and SN2 will always give 100% inversion of your stereochemistry. And this is important because we always deal with a backside attack, right? We don't have carbocations. When the nucleophile is present, 
Okay, we have to have a backside attack uh, for the leaving group as it's leaving the nucleophile. If it's going to be present in that transition state, it needs to perform a backside attack. So to give you a general idea, we'll switch back to black here. Okay, we're not going to spend too much time on this, but it is important. Um, so here's my carbon, right? Here is my leaving group X. And then in terms of my tetrahedral center, right? I have one, two, and three. Okay, one, two, and three. I'm just arbitrarily labeling these. So here I am, and this is not ranking for R, S here when I'm writing one, two, and three. A halogen would most likely get rank one, okay? So let's just keep that in mind. I'm not talking about assigning R, S. I'm talking about the actual stereochemical orientation uh, when we're looking at this here. So I have my nucleophile, right? Some nucleophile. And so when I send that nucleophile in, it's going to have to perform a backside attack. That's the only way that it can get in as the leaving group is going to leave, just like this. And so what ends up happening is that during the transition state, you end up with something that looks kind of like this. You've got nucleophile, right? partially formed to carbon. Carbon has one, two, and three. And then it's partly letting go of this, right? So this would be the transition state in this SN2 reaction. Remember that SN2 reactions do not have intermediates. They have one transition state. It's a single step and then it's over. So we're passing through this transition state here. If this was negative, it's now partially negative, right? And if this was is on its way to being negative, this is going to be partially negative. So the X becomes minus the nucleophile that was negative originally in an SN2 reaction. There's a this is a minus charge I'm adding up here. Goes from partially negative to neutral once it finally adds. But what's happening here is as this nucleophile hits with force from the back, notice that these come up into uh, this sort of back and forth position where they're going to be inverted, right? So as this group is leaving, as the X is leaving, the other compounds get pushed the other way. And so when I finish off, I've got a nucleophile that is bonded to the carbon. Now one, it's still in front, but it's over here, right? and two is over here and three is over here and so we would refer to this as an inversion of stereochemistry and this happens a hundred percent of the time because you always have to have backside attack when you're dealing with sn2 and that's again uh due to sterics if you go back and you uh watch that first video so that takes care of SN2 reactions. We are good to go with that. And I will see you guys for SN1. We will talk about the differences. There's certainly a lot of differences, some similarities, but a lot of differences. And then we will put it all together and do some practice problems at the end. So I hope this has been helpful. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, I will get back to comments as soon as possible, and if you stay subscribed, you will get all the latest updates as they come out. So I appreciate your continued support and investment in your knowledge in learning with me, and I will see you guys for the next lecture.